Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. How are you this morning, Dr. Paul? Doing very well, good. and uh, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you some questions today. Uh -oh. uh, you know, the subject of our program is, why are we still <laughs> in Syria? <laughs> and, uh, but my bigger question is, why are we everywhere still? And, uh, you know, we finally had to come home from Vietnam, and it wasn't all that tragic. The tragedy was staying. Yeah. And uh, we've stayed in Korea, and that is still a mess. So that is still the question that uh, we're going to try to answer today. And there's, you know, some good news and some bad news on, on the uh, international scene. The one good news is, you know, I wish it were good news, I'm not convinced, and that is that uh, North Korea, um, South Korea and the United States have decided to tone down their war game. Yeah. And that's pretty good. And also there are peace talks, uh, you know, with North Korea. Um, you know, in Finland, in the United States, I mean, and South Korea, this is this is pretty good. But at the same time, the other headline is the Russian military warns a major war in Syria is imminent. Mm. And you read the details, and you find out that we're beefing up. The one headline showed that we're beefing up at Al Tamf. It happens to be where there's some oil. Could it be true that some of those slogans used even before we went into Iraq, it's all about oil? Could it be about oil? Most people don't think about uh, Syria as being a big oil com country, but it's in the region and it's pretty, uh, pretty important territory and we've invested a lot. And some people say we, we need to stay there uh, because we, we don't want to have put all this energy in, into this and, and have it waste. A lot of hard work went in there, and let's not let it go to waste. Let's not let any of death and destruction be in vain, so let's continue the process. So why don't you explain to me why we're still there and see if we can convince the audience that we ought to just come home. Exactly. <laughs> No, I think the oil well issue is good. And this is something we both saw in Zero Hedge that they put something up in southfront.org about the fact that the U.S. is building, appears to be building a major military facility near the Altanf uh, area. This is near the border uh, where there happens to be oil. There's not a lot of oil in Syria, but there is some in the northeast, and this looks to be where the U.S. is settling down, settling its troops. I think that's one. The other part is they said, Tillerson, before he went, explicitly said, we don't want to let Assad get control over territory that he's lost uh, in the east and northeast part of the country. Of course, it's his own country. And I think the third thing is it's an easy staging ground for war with Iran. We, we want to be there. We want to build it up because the neocons who are infiltrating the administration continuously, this is their big prize. They want war with Iran. Well, our leaders are also concerned about uh, losing credibility in foreign policy and being a credible player because some things go on without us these days. I wouldn't think that is the worst thing in the world if we lost a little credibility on what we're doing because uh, it's becoming a very great task for us to maintain our empire. It's, uh, it's very costly. And uh, right now, it looks like it's stressing out our financial markets. When you think about the dollar and what's happening in our stock market and the budget deficits and all, and it looks like that's not going to lighten up. I think uh, uh, this budget they're trying to get through at $1.3 trillion, a lot of more money for the military going in there. So that, that is a bit stressful. Matter of fact, even today with uh, the news that we're looking at, on the short run, news does affect the stock market. The stock market at the moment happens to be done sharply over 400 points. That doesn't mean that uh, at the end of the day it'll be quite different, but there is stress in the financial market, and it is related to this. Ultimately, though, uh, those markets relate to fundamental premises of deficits in Federal Reserve, mischief, and, and this sort of thing. But uh, this news is, isn't helpful to the financial market. But this whole idea about a potential war, the ducks are being lined up because it's just not the United States that involve. You know, we hide behind the umbrella, sometimes the United Nations when they do our bidding. And other times it's NATO. We claim we complain about, uh, about them, but at the same time, it's it is NATO against Russia right now. When you see who's who's lining up in Syria, um, Britain's lining up with us, and France is lining up with us, and uh, we have Israel there. Their uh, their interests are very very powerful. We don't hear much about them, but uh, I think they are very instrumental in, in what's going on. And then you have the Turks are involved too, and sometimes I think they're all with us or all against us, and, and you have the Kurds to be involved with. But the big, the big items are 
you know, the EU, United States against Russia and Iran. And, uh, and this, this could be uh, something that uh, maybe is not planned. I don't, uh, it's, I just don't want to believe they said, yeah, we're planning this war. But their policies are so ridiculous, it looks like they plan war, war, they, they intend to have it because what they're doing, well, well, well we need is somebody diplomatic. We'll put somebody at the UN that maybe tone it down and give us a better frame. So we send Nikki Haley. <laughs> yeah, she's going to calm us down and say, well, this war is not necessary. And all she does is stir the pot. Yeah, exactly. You know, I want to go back to something you said a little earlier. You talked about the budget. I don't know if you saw, but uh, President Trump tweeted today, and it, I think it encompasses everything that's wrong. He, he tweeted, he bragged, he said, I got my money for the wall, more's coming. I got a big boost in military spending, more's coming for that. Yeah, I had to put a, waste a bunch of money on junk for the Democrats, what they wanted, but that's okay, that's worth the price. And that just <laughs> says everything, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and you, you know, this is all, it, it, it is uh, uh, consistent with the idea that uh, the, the uh, Keynesians really win and have won, ultimately they'll, they'll lose, and that is that deficits don't matter. Yeah. And, you know, conservatives have accepted that. They might give lip service back, you know, to it, but they always want more money, and deficits aren't so bad if it's military. Yeah. And uh, it isn't because we're weak, it's because uh, the profits have to be continuous for the arms manufacturers. And we should, going back to Syria, we should, we, we should always try to remember this and pound it home. Why did we get involved in Syria explicitly? First of all, we got involved when, as you mentioned yesterday, Obama said uh, Assad must go. That was because a supposedly a peaceful protest against the government of Syria was put down with force. So even if you accept that premise for us to become involved, increasingly involved, Look at where we are now, where we're occupying 30% of the country. We're talking about staging for war with Iran, preparing for war with, with Russia. It's not a board game, you know, this is serious business. So we have to remind ourselves how we got into this. You know, it's interesting, and we should probably do a show on this next week, but remember Libya. Remember President Sarkozy of France. He was arrested this week. He was arrested because Gaddafi had given him millions of dollars for his campaign, election campaign, then he had Gaddafi killed. So, <laughs> so there is a lot going on here, and I think that has a lot to do with Syria. You know, b back to uh, what's going on in Korea, there is a story out that uh, North Korea, th these are probably conspiratorial uh, statements made, North Korea is now, uh, you know, trying to help uh, the Syrian government to develop more gas. Yeah. You know, this whole idea that uh, this is this is going on. Of course, he needs gas to gas his own people <laughs> without any evidence of it. And the Amer and the Syrian people seem to be galvanizing around Assad. But, you know, at one time, one moment, they're saying, well, we're having talks with them and we're going to tone down our, our military exercises there. At the other time, they send out these stories like this that they're helping help in Syria, but they're using this whole thing about poison gas. And some people, and I think the, the uh, Russians are suggesting, yeah, that they come up with a false flag and say there's been poison gases, that is not going to be tolerated. That was sort of their line in the sand. They better not come up with this because, uh, but but the whole thing is, it's hard to figure this out at one moment. You, you know, we're trying to get along better with uh, North Korea for the <laughs> moment. At the next moment, they're trying to give gases to, uh, you know, poison gases to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Assad. Remember the other day we talked about that poll showing that most Americans have forgotten when the Iraq war started. I think the real problem is they forgot how the Iraq war started. And it was this exact thing, these bogus idea, these bogus claims that Saddam was colluding with Al Qaeda to attack the Twin Towers. The neocons put together all these lies. They're doing the same thing with this North Korea business in Syria. You know, sometimes we like to uh, give them the benefit of the doubt. They just blunder into it, bad policies and na naivety. But uh, there are other times when you realize that plans are well laid way in advance because this whole idea of invading and eventually overthrowing Saddam Hussein, that was there a long time before 9-11. Even though he had nothing to do with 9-11, yeah. the plan was already there, and that is the excuse. They yeah. use this as an excuse, and the American people get convinced. You know, he has weapons of mass destruction. He was part of the 9-11 uh, attack, and uh, the war goes on, and just 
look at the carnage that occurred, not only against American, American citizens, the loss of liberty, the loss of the finances, the military personnel killed, and the military people come back and uh, they, that are part of this suicide epidemic mm. of, of military. That, that, that all goes on. But uh, uh, that, was, that was planned. For, they, they had to remake the Middle East. And the people who designed those policies uh, do fit into the category of neoconservatives. I mean, they, they, they wanted this to happen. So there are times when I just don't want to believe that any decent person, any decent government, certainly my own government, would deliberately, you know, go out and start a war. But I still hear them on TV now, mm. you know, about why we have to go to war. And, of course, uh, that came up a few times in the presidential campaign yeah. that uh, they were pushing for war back then, too, yeah. as usual. As usual. Now, speaking of neocons, Nikki Haley, whose name came up earlier and comes up all the time because she's one of the worst hawks. Now, on March 12th, she threatened military action against Syria. Uh, and she blamed Syria and Russia because she said this U.N., we, everyone voted on the ceasefire from the U.N., and they are violating it by attacking East Ghouta, and she's ramping up for the U.S. to attack. But what she does is this claim is erroneous because the U.N. resolution explicitly excluded al-Qaeda and any other listed terrorist organization from the ceasefire. The people that are being attacked in Ghouta are groups that fall into that category. So she's lying and she knows it. She has to know it. And, uh, you know, you're not allowed to say anything that sounds like it's fair and balanced when you're dealing with Russia. You know, then, then you, we, we're bad guys then. <laughs> but um, if you look back at what was in writing, uh, what NATO said about the disarmament uh, of the Soviets, you know, after the Soviets were collapsed, and, and the agreement with NATO, and NATO had agreed with our agreement that we wouldn't go up and move in and be on the borders of Russia. And yet we're the ones that broke that and we constantly pester and move and close and try to antagonize. At the same time, uh, you know, uh, so far, Russia has been closer to international law, if there's ever any respect for international law. International law is used when it fits somebody's purpose. <laughs> but uh, they, they have, uh, you know, come to an ally, it was uh, Sadat, and, uh, and yet, where is the justification? I wonder what the American people think the justification is for us. There. We're worrying about why don't why don't we come home? What are we doing there? Well, why did we go? Yeah. You know, I, I imagine uh, most people getting out of high school or even college uh, might not uh, have the biggest idea about all that. So uh, it's a, it's a shame. We need to we need to do a better job, Daniel. We need to have a program that circulates and people <laughs> hear and get some of the answers on why are we there and why don't we come home, you know, and the sooner the better. Exactly. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel. I just want to, if I can just say one more thing, Dr. Paul, because I saw this and I just can't not comment on it. This is Nikki Haley, uh, her statement on March 12th. Here's a short quote. Uh, Blaming Russia and Syria for the, viol uh, for the violence. There are terrorists in Syria, she said. But the, Russians and Syrian, but the Russian and Syrian regimes label anyone as terrorists who resist their absolute control. Okay, well, let's think about that for a second. What about in the U.S.? If there was an armed group that occupied, uh, say, Utah, you know, or we're talking about a big part of the country, who, who occupied a part and was armed and they were bent on establishing a, a theocracy uh, using extreme law, would the U.S. not view them as terrorists? <laughs> look at Waco. Look at all the times when there was a small group that posed no threat. So it's absolutely absurd. If, this, if, the, if the tables were turned, the U.S. would be using all of its power to get rid of this enclave controlled by these groups. I think that's a very good point, and I've tried to make that over the years, is that we ought to always ask the question, when we're getting ready to do something, uh, how would we react if they did it to us? You know, whether it's our own government or another government which is doing to it. I used to ask the question, what would we say if the Chinese Navy and uh, the Russian Navy was in the Gulf of Mexico in international water? You know, uh, we wouldn't be too happy about that and we would react in a different way. But uh, too often uh, uh, the people go along and they're satisfied 
but they get a little bit nervous when they see the economic conditions deteriorating. I see the, uh, the uh, Congress right now is preparing to bail out uh, many, many pension funds because those are the, those are the long-term conditions that are, are building and there's no easy answer for it. And the financial markets are going to be very, very rocky. Uh, so they just can't keep printing the money and uh, this administration thinks they can. They think that we can keep going. They keep justifying our position over there and threatening, intimidating. Then on top of it all, with all these reasons to shake up uh, international trade, we, we get, we're bound and determined to get into a trade war. Put on sanctions and tariffs makes no sense whatsoever. That is the reason that we are going to persist here at the Liberty Report to present the case for non-interventionists, for us to mine our own business and bring our troops home. I think the world would be a better place in which to live. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.